Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, in a moment, we're going to digest what went on today with our panel, the historian Simon Sharma, Dia Chakravarti, the Telegraph's Brexit editor, Anthony Gardner, who was Barack Obama's ambassador to the EU between 2014 and 17, and Freddie Gray, the Spectator's deputy editor. First, a brief test of the waters away from those large protests today. The marginal constituency of Walsall North was won by the Tories at that last fateful election. Its population voted leave. So after Trump's intervention and last week's deal at Chequers, what is their take on Brexit? David Grossman reports. Walsall North was one of half a dozen seats that the Conservatives gained from Labour at the last general election, bucking the national trend. Why? Well, many believe there is a one-word explanation, Brexit. The Prime Minister's Brexit deal, or proposed deal, is beginning to filter out of the Westminster bubble into real-world communities. The West Midlands was crucial to Theresa May hanging on to power in 2017, and how the deal plays here is crucial. Do people who voted to leave think they're getting the Brexit they voted for? So how do conservative activists view the Brexit white paper? John Sheath and Raj Palverdi are immersed in West Midlands conservative politics. They know the minds of local party members as well as anyone. I think they want closure. They want this deal done, sealed. Um, not here. I think if there is another referendum, I think the vote will be even more to leave than remain. Really? More? Yes. Why do you say that? Uh, because I think people are now... Uh, looking at the get, they've now got an understanding of the detail of what immigration was, what the tariffs were, what, what is happening in terms of customs union, free movement of people, how it's affecting the infrastructure in this country, how the hospitals are being uh, overburdened, how the GP surgeries can't cope, how schools can't cope, how the housing uh, departments can't cope with the extra influx of people without any planning, any thought given to freedom of movement doesn't mean people just coming yesterday. What about the remaining infrastructure? Pressure on our schools, hospitals, um, many, many public services. I don't know whether people have changed their mind. I think people are getting tired of Brexit. They're seeing it every day. They're seeing different people put, putting different ideas forward. Do, do you think there might be an appetite then to take a deal just to end the process? I think with some people that could be the case. Um, I know of a person that was felt very strongly um, about the uh, recent white paper and felt it, it didn't go far enough. Um, but I think overall, I, I think people would like to get a deal done and we can move on. I think it's a case of being able to move on from the what's gone on over the last year, year and a half. It's just been, it feels like it's hard work. Uh, voters in Walsall North talking to David Grossman there. Let's move on to our panel. A welcome again to Simon, to Dear, to Anthony and to Freddie. Nice of you all to come in uh, at this late hour. Um, I began the night by asking what just happened. Simon, to you. <laughs> what, what do you, where are we left now, 24 hours on? Well, with an incredible theatrical display of a kind of free radical, if we a surprising term to... Uh, what we've seen, actually, is the kind of bipolar Trump to the max. Um, the interview with The Sun, undercutting Theresa May, um, lauding the capacities of Boris Johnson to be the next prime minister, saying that all European culture, the fabric of Europe has been changed, is one kind of Trump. It, absolutely authentic Trump, then followed by the sweeping up exercise today. So the, the effect of that is pretty much actually we were in the position of often his own administration, not having a clue which is the real Trump and not knowing therefore how you could proceed. Doesn't have a clue, doesn't care, just made the wrong call on Thursday night. How do you read it, Freddie? Well, I think one of the myths about Trump is that he's wildly unpredictable. He's wild, but it's not really unpredictable. No. I, I think you could, you know, it'd be impossible to predict how these, how today would have played out. That would take a real prognosticator. 
But we all knew that he was going to do something quite crazy. We didn't know what it would be. And then there would be a press conference and he'd roll back from it and try and be more sympathetic. That's how he rolls. It's how he rolls with Kim Jong-un and how he rolls with Theresa May. But I, I think the overriding thing is just the hilarity of it. And then actually, I mean, even people who really, really hate Donald Trump just find it funny now. And that's, something's changing there. I so think. funny is dangerous or funny is good? It's hard to know. I mean, I tend to think funny is good. Uh, because I'm a very shallow person. <laughs> well, because you're not taking splitting. him seriously in terms I'm, of the danger that he may represent or that people believe you... I've never taken him literally or seriously, no. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not a side-splitting gas, really, without being too solemn, to basically nearly destroy the WTO to sort of attack NATO so that, you know, bodies are rolling around. No, it's are, it, it's not... grave, grave matters of state, and I realise they are serious yeah. and important. But I just defy anyone not to watch that press conference and laugh. Let's get back to the matters of state. Did he leave Theresa May looking a fool? Did we feel sorry for her, dear? What was your takeaway? I thought the expectations were so low. We were expecting Theresa May to look and act really, really awkward around him. And, and I, I do think he is unpredictable, if I may uh, disagree with, a little bit with Freddie. I do think he's uh, a bit un unpredictable. I'm not sure we knew how exactly he was going to behave, particularly after that um, Sun interview. Um, but it seemed to me that she didn't look quite as awkward as we expected her to look. Um, in the end, when he did, I know, in the end, when he did row back, um, it seemed like they did manage to uh, finish it off quite amicably. Uh, but the two things that I took away from it is that at least for the duration of the um, press conference, I don't know what's going to happen afterwards if Trump is going to change his mind, but for the duration of the press conference, um, Downing Street had managed to convince him of two things, it seemed. One is that she cannot walk away because she is stuck. That's what he said. That's a direct quote. Um, and also from the EU, that is. Um, and the other, the second thing is that he said that he had read reports that a deal, if the Chequers um, agreement were to, was to go ahead, a, a deal uh, with the US would not be possible. He has now changed his mind after speaking to her. I, I'm taking that as Downing Street. And apparently a deal now is absolutely possible. So I wonder where it leaves us with this intervention by US presidents. Uh, you worked very closely with Obama. He memorably intervened just before the Brexit vote itself, advising against it. Did he set a precedent now that Trump has just followed, or was that a mistake, or is it ever the right moment for a US president to crack well, into Well, the two the things first? are not remotely similar. He came here and he said something which I regretted. He said, back of the queue. I thought that was not the right thing to say. Did you tell him that at the I time? I certainly did. I, well, I didn't uh, say to him that he should say it, and I was critical privately uh, of that decision to say it. Did David but, Cameron say it? Uh, well, no, I have no idea whether he did or not. But this was stated during a visit uh, to support a head of state uh, during a visit to the UK. And he was asked many times, because the US, remember, has a very significant interest in the decision about Brexit. The decision that the president has now made was made during a state visit to undermine a head of state when she was so rolling out a head cover. It? So it's okay to come in as a loyal voice, but not to come in as, if you like, well, a disruptor in chief. Next also, words. the tone of those two comments, I think, cannot be compared. Also, it was based on a fundamental misunderstanding, if I can just get into this point about the free trade agreement. A lot of U.S. companies, and I spoke to many of them over the three years of my tenure in Brussels, uh, want the UK to remain closely aligned with the EU because Britain has been a gateway to the EU market. Same reason for the Japanese companies who mm. invested here. That's the first thing. So to think that American companies all want the UK to ditch EU regulations is incorrect. The second point is on agriculture. It is true it's a big bone in our throats that the EU has these regulations about hormones and GMOs and so forth. But the idea that the UK is going to ditch all of those regulations, do a free trade deal, is crazy. It's not right. going to happen. And this was Ed Miliband's point just earlier. He doesn't actually like the idea of a trade deal with the US. He thinks there is nothing particularly to trust in that, either with Trump or with what it means for future standards in the UK. I, th I think Trump is sincere when he says that he would love a beautiful tra trade deal. I, I, I don't know. But mean, what I'm saying is the, the Miliband point is we shouldn't be chasing this anyway. We're crazy to start chasing a deal with the US on trade, which is far from perfect. I think, I think it would be crazy sorry. to... Sh sorry, carry on. No, no I, I was going to say, I think the Brexiteers' point would be it should be up to us and not to Brussels to decide what should and should not be... Uh, um, acceptable to us and if we are if we are leaving ourselves in a position when we're becoming rule takers without any say in making those rules then it's not really us who are deciding this 
But there's a whole I illusion think. anyway. I mean, you, the American trade accounts for, as we all know, you know, 17 or 18 percent of total trade, as against last year or I think 2016, EU was 43 percent. That basic issue of commercial proximity is not going to change. So the issue is actually what kind of ingratiation to kind of kowtow to Trumpian bluster and bullying do we have to go through for this miserable 17% Do you agree? No, none of this has made any, any difference in terms of no, holding hands or helping him down the aisle or whatever she did when she went disagree. to Washington. I do disagree to Washington. Then, I think that it would be very foolish to, to, to shun Trump because we find him so vulgar and abhorrent. Um, when we when we do need America, no one's no one's naive enough to think that you know America can suddenly swap with Europe as a trading partner and be equally important. That doesn't mean it could not be very important well, to Britain. Bre and therefore Brexiteers are prioritising a free trade with trade, easy trade with Europe. Of course, that's what they're talking no, about. I think, it doesn't I think have to be a priority. Say that we we need to do, do do trade deals with both sides. It's not one or the other. It never was the case. No, the, the issue is not shunning Trump. The issue is speaking up and defending one's values when they're being attacked. For courts are being attacked or justice isn't being attacked. Well, have we done and that enough, do you think? Here in this country? Yes. Well, I was disappointed when I saw in this country as well during the Brexit debate, judges being attacked and the media being attacked. This is a very dangerous road. And I think you've written Enemies about this as well. People. Enemies of the people. We are not that you know, many steps away from the 1930s. So it is important for leaders to stand up and say certain things are unacceptable. And for the EU to remind this president that it has leverage and is going to use leverage okay. on trade in particular. So on that note, should Theresa May have told Trump he was utterly wrong and misguided and out of step to make the remarks he did on the Brexit deal? And critically, what are her MPs and voters thinking now about this Chequers proposal? It won't have done it a whole lot of good, you have to say. I mean, the notion is actually that when Obama... I, I agree, actually, that it was regrettable that he chose to intervene. It famously had a backlash effect. I don't know. I'm not quite sure if this will have a backlash. In, in fact, Donald Trump supporting, uh, attacking the, the Chequers deal is the best chance it has of being popular. I'm not sure I, I, I quite believe that, but it kind of done it a, a, a great deal of good. Should Theresa May have said something um, maybe she did. Maybe she did in private, but I'd be kind of surprised. The answer is yes, she should. It's not just a matter of actually, I agree with Ed Miliband, but it's not just a matter of kind of abstractly defined human rights, basic civil decency, separating three-year-olds from their parents, not really being a good or moral idea. It's a case of actually attacking, you know, mm. making NATO inoperable. I mean, he has a point that everybody should pay their and, fair and due, do but he does it in the way of a kind of raucous, destructive, blundering, yes. ignorant but bully. I, I want to talk about May now and talking of decency, uh, dear, your mm. paper this week accused her of treason. No, it absolutely did not. I'm sorry. It, it asked a question article, of whether asked she question, was being treasonous. It asked the question, at the, and if you read the article, which I think everybody should, it actually said, no, she absolutely is not guilty of that. But the point that article was making is that we have been receiving letters suggesting that, and we have not actually printed those letters. But is it's she also guilty important. of treason? That was the question. You and the article very clearly said that she wasn't. Oh, well, you could say, is she a murderer? And then say she wasn't. I mean, you're raising the question. That, I think that's so lazy to just read a headline and not actually give the, the writer who wrote that article quite sensitively to actually read the entire article and so, then judge so it. So I'm hearing no regrets So I think, I think that's if just... a lot of people strong. are saying Theresa May's a murderer, I think it's fair enough to ask the question and then answer, and then answer it. it. Just to clarify for our viewers, nobody's saying Theresa May's a murderer. But <laughs> well. on this question of treason, it's a bigger, you know, it's a bigger issue that you're talking about. Do people feel that she has betrayed the Brexit ideal to the point where they're not going to back this checkers? It will, if anything, uh, if, 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 if we can read anything from the, the hundreds and thousands of letters that we've been getting, then a lot of people are very, very worried and feel betrayed that she, as a Remainer, asked Brexiteers to lend her their support, which they did, and now they feel betrayed. Y you know how the EU works better than anyone here. Um, do you think that she will get this as a deal through the EU? No. <laughs> there's no chance. Right. There's, there's no chance on so either we, the we single just... market or the customs partnership. Let's be clear about it. But okay. the EU needs to be very careful. It can't just say no because of the risk of undermining your position. But what's been proposed are things in most cases that cannot be accepted. Let, let's be clear about something. The UK, while it's been a member, has tried to have all of the advantages of being a non-member. Now that it's seeking to be a non-member, it's seeking to have all the advantages of being a member. Mm. 
The EU wants to have a single market for goods while having a lot of the advantages of uh, being out, right? Including not accepting the free movement of people. And the customs union says, well, we're not part of the customs union, but we want this new framework of a customs partnership that gives us all of the advantages of being actually in the customs union. So you, you've made you, us feel like we're actually just having a pillow fight here that is not even going to get as far as Brussels then? Well, it represents progress. It does represent progress, right? And I hope this is, let's progress be clear. with a big no at the end of it. <laughs> but I, I regret the fact that so much time has been taken over the last year and a half or two years since the referendum on fighting battles that couldn't be won. Okay. I've been, been negotiating for a living, and I believe you should negotiate on the basis of a true understanding of your true leverage and fighting the battles you can win. We've run out of time. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Thank you for like coming in. <laughs> well, we, you could stay for another six months if you want.